okay, I'm um I'm filming this video. Uh, actually, it's for myself because um when I started investing into stocks or equities, for example, um there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, but because there's so much information, right, and the incentives of content creators are mostly to maximize clicks. So a lot of the information that they put out could be accurate. It could not be accurate as well. And so like, I want to make, in a sense, a uh, investing framework for myself such that I can always reference this video in the future uh, whenever I do investing or whatever, or it could send to a friend such that they understand uh, the thesis of investing into, into particularly equities in a sense. And also such that, you know, I can, yeah, I can reference back to the video and I can see what I've learned of what I've not learned or any new insights that I've have. Uh, but basically in every single industry that you go into, you need to know like the inside information, right? Or you need to know like how the market operates and how uh, the players in the market, like what their incentives are. And obviously the financial industry is a very uh, regulated one. There's also a lot of insider trading and um, stuff like that. But I won't talk about that. What I want to talk about is that if I'm an ordinary person and citizen, like these are the things that uh, you should probably know if you want to invest and get a good and decent return. Um, and I'm speaking from my experience. I'm not trying to give financial advice here because this video is really for me. Um, but I, I do want, uh, for example, if you're my friend or whatever it is, or if you're a financial expert, uh, you know, if you do like finance professionally, uh, I would like to see if the information that I've gathered so far and the data sets that I have based on my own experience investing in the stock market with my own money, um, whether it is actually accurate or corroborates with um, correct information. Okay, so um, I've created this framework for myself in terms of um, if I'm thinking from the standpoint of if I'm a normal person, um, I don't have like millions and millions and billions of dollars to deploy in the stock market, uh, but I also want to grow the account fast. Um, I won't say like just dump everything in the Vanguard or the S&P and grow at 7%. Like that's not the, the criteria for this framework right here. This one is more like how do you uh, selectively pick uh, growth stories such that your account can actually grow uh, rapidly and also uh, can grow with, not, I won't say minimal risk, but like with your downside risk being protected basically. So um, I'm going to go into it and there are certain factors that are in the industry and stuff like that and also certain tools. But if you are a, a a watcher of this video right now and you have any advice or if you think that any of my theories or stuff like that stuff that I learned is wrong or can be improved please feel free to comment down below because uh, my job here is not to educate or like tell you what is the correct thing my job is this is based on my experience and this is what I think and I'm just putting it out there and to see is hey if I'm wrong on this please let me know whether I'm wrong because I, I don't actually know whether I'm wrong um, because my learnings is based on my experience right so if you have something a superior form uh, of a theory or whatever it is, please feel free to share your opinion. Um, you will, I would like I really like to hear it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, stock investing basically, uh, whatever. Blah blah blah. Please. Okay. So the first thing is, um, there's individual versus index fund types, right? So the first one, if you see here, uh, individual versus index fund type. So if I want to grow at a seven percent, uh, every single year, for example, I will just put it in S and P five hundred. I, I don't really care because those companies are stable and stuff like that. And uh, nonetheless, the market for the 500, S&P 500 will grow every single year and it's projected to grow because on the historical, uh, if touch wood, nothing happens, like it should grow every single year because those are generally the strongest public companies in the world. Okay, so that's the first thing. Then the other one is whether you want to invest in individual stocks. So the cons of in, of investing in the individual stocks is that um, because there's so much concentration in one specific company, if you choose the wrong company and that company, for example, sheds 40% of the market value, uh, your investment basically sheds 40% as well. Okay, so that's that's technically a risk, right? That you have to stomach or take or understand the risk on that area if you want to in invest in individual stocks. Okay, so if you in invest in an index fund, for example, index, index fund is a S&P 500 or stuff like that. All right, so let, let me write down the first factor. The first factor would probably be um, individual. And then the second one would, would be an index. So an index is S&P 500, right? This one uh, grows at 7% generally. And then uh, an individual, right? You can obviously, you can grow 40% in a year. You can grow 20%. You can also negative 40%, right? So it's not like um, it's risk-free. Nothing is risk-free, right? Um, but this also could go, can grow 200%, can go 300%, right? You can basically 5x, 4x your money. And if you are putting in, for example, 80K, you're putting in 100K into it, right? This can become like 400K. Right, but obviously normalized returns. Like people should not be greedy. Like seven percent is actually anything above seven percent is considered um, solid. 
anything above seven percent is, is solid, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so that's that's the first the first thing that you need to understand. The second one is like industry strength. So what what do I mean by by industry strength? It means that um, Warren Buffett always says there's like a circle of competence, something like that, right? There's a circle of competence. Uh, let me just write competence here. And then basically you when you're working um, as a working adult or whatever it is, you normally have a circle of competence, right? So for example, I'm in advertising, right? So the, the, the companies that I look for, or like I, I totally understand are Google, right? They're Amazon, uh, they're Facebook. Um, let me see what else. There's like Pinterest, there's probably a Snapchat, stuff like that. Maybe there's like Trade Desk, um, among other companies, right? Basically within advertising, right? So I understand digital advertising. So like that's my circle of competence. But that doesn't mean that if, if I only know advertising, it, it doesn't mean like I cannot go into like an energy sector and I, I go study, study the companies, how they make money and then also capitalize on that trend, right? For example, if I know something about semiconductors, right? And then there's TSMC right here. And I know about the cycles and the boom and, and what, what uh, the AI boom, for example, has helped on the semiconductor, semiconductor side. Um, I can still play in this market. I can still generate alpha in this market. It doesn't mean you are kept out of it. It's just more like if you invest, generally what they say is that you want to stick to your circle of competence so that, hey, you have like conviction in your bet, right? Because you know that the, the, the market may think something is false, but you know may think something is true. So in a sense, that's the, consider the contrarian approach. If you know something that other people don't have, if you have like a piece of data set that other people don't have, but you have, uh, you can generate alpha uh, on the upside, basically. Yeah, so um, that's what it means by industry. Um, and also obviously certain industries, okay, uh, certain industries, uh, they outperform others, right? So obviously big tech, big tech is always outperforming everything else because it's, it's the most innovative, it's the most scalable, um, and at the same time, like it, it grows just much faster, right? If, if you compare an energy sector, uh, I would even call the automotive se sector, right? It's like how many new cars are people gonna buy? The only reason why Tesla is like booming, for example, is because they completed, uh, they have a new category, right? They have the internal co combustion vehicle and then they have the, the electric vehicle. And then the electric vehicle is basically an entirely new category within uh, automotive uh, company, uh, sorry, c category. So. In a sense, the, the, the market or the the size of the market is this. And then they basically opened up the market, right? So they basically, so a lot of the ICE cars um, are going to buy EVs. And then maybe some people who don't have a car at all, they are considering to buy EVs. So they, they technically opened up the market. That, that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you must understand, like, obviously certain industries grow very fast. Uh, some others, maybe energy, energy sector may not grow fast. Uh, but there are like catalysts uh, to growth as well. Right. So, for example, if um, if Biden or whoever whoever is, is is the president or whatever it is, they have they have, they have an initiative. They are pouring money into like um like clean energy, right? So clean energy is like climate change and stuff like that. Right. All these people so suddenly there's a mandate from the top that the government is saying that this is an important uh, priority for us, and so we're gonna pour money into this into this whatever it is. So who is gonna benefit? Right, the, the the trend is basically okay. The recycling companies, maybe, um, the the EV people, um, the people doing wind, maybe the the people doing solar and stuff. And then from from this group of companies, for example, then you want to spot like who are the who are the biggest players in the market because the people at the top normally uh, get most of the, the the gains because they are the monopolies. So um, you you generally want to invest in monopolies because they are the strongest uh, people in the industry. And so when they're, when they're the strongest and there's competition, for example, normally they don't die. And when they don't they don't die, generally they also gain like maybe majority of, of the market share and majority of the gains because um, the pension funds and whoever are going to pour money in. Okay. So that's that's number two, that's industry strength. And number three is revenue growth. Will the revenue grow? So what I, what I, I didn't understand last time was that uh, like percentage gain, uh, market cap, and like, like, what does your investment actually mean? Like, like if I buy a stock, like, what, what does it actually mean, right? So we talk about two different um, types of uh, stuff right here. So you talk about market cap. So uh, a market cap, right? If a company is, is uh, worth a $3 billion market cap, right? And then versus a company who is like a $90 billion market cap, right? It is like significantly harder for a, a $90 billion a company to grow to $300 billion. Even though this is maybe like a 3x or whatever, right? It's a like times three, 
right? But if, uh, if a company can grow from 3 billion to 9 billion, for example, um, it seems relatively more, it seems relatively easier purely because the number is smaller, right? So like you don't have, you don't have to grow rev revenue as fast. There's not, um, yeah, basically like, for example, if, if company at, at 90 billion here, for example, right? Um, and then they are at maybe 5 billion of revenue, for example. Uh, maybe they have to grow to 15 billion, right? Um, that's my guess. And then this is a company here, and then they have like 200 million revenue, for example. They need to grow to like maybe 600 mil, something like that. So they need to grow into the valuation or whatever. Um, you might say that it's easier to grow, it's easier to get, it's easier to three times the revenue here than the than to three times the revenue here. That's why um, like there's a potential to grow, right? There's a potential to grow into this re evaluation so that in a, in a sense, your your upside is higher because your, your stock price can times times three faster in a shorter amount of time. Whereas it'll probably take you a longer time for 90 billion to get to 300 billion. Okay, there, there are certain exceptions, I think, where for example, like uh, in the NVIDIA case, and then like AI is a macro trend. So an AI is a macro trend, right? They went from like 500 billion to, I don't, I don't know how much they are at, maybe like 1 trillion, right? So like, like a ton of money is being poured in and uh, the money flow is, is very, very fast, right? So when there are macro trends here, for example, and the money flow is fast, then it's like a surefire bet that they'll grow because the entire market is pouring money into it. And then all the all the guys in the hedge funds and then all the guys in, in the banks and whatever, um, and the pension funds, whoever it is, they're all pouring money. So when they pour money, they, they literally pour like hundreds of billions of dollars at the same time, something like that. Yeah, so you have, you have two arguments, right? The argument is that, um, I guess uh, for a small company, right? A small company to become a big company, there's a lot of upside, right? 3 billion to 30 billion, right? But then again, if you're a small company to, to begin with, it's actually harder to grow because you don't, you're not a monopoly yet, right? But um, there is room to grow, right? Um, this is a, a 10X, basically. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't know where this thought is going. <laughs> it's a bit confusing, but anyways, basically, how, how, how do you actually see where the, the, the revenue grows and stuff? Um, what I like to do is that uh, I like to go to Google Finance or Yahoo Finance. Um, so I'll bring up a stock ticker right here. So this is CrowdStrike. This is a, a cybersecurity company. So in my mind, cybersecurity is like an essential for uh, the backbone of any industry purely because um, people want to prevent cyber attacks now and till the end of time, basically, right? They want to protect their data and stuff. So normally what I do is that I'll go into show financials here. Um, and then I will go into, I, I like seeing charts. I don't I don't really like reading the balance sheet. I mean, it's important, but uh, I like seeing the charts. And then I like I, I like to see, okay, annual growth, you can see here in 2020, this one, is growing every single year. So it shows that the revenue is growing. If the re revenue is growing, generally the, the market cap is going to grow at the same time because that's what the investor story is. And then the, on the quarterly side, like it, I want to see it growing as well. Right, every single quarter you should be uh, growing your revenue. If you're not growing your revenue, it means it's stalling. It means that once it stalls, um, you know, generally people pull money out of the stock or they sell the stock, which the stock price will go down basically. Yeah. So th this should be continuously growing. Your uh, basically every single year, every single quarter, it shows a healthy strategy is is happening, right? So that that's the third one. Will revenue grow? Right. Re revenue growth is very very important because it dictates the story, which which comes to the next point is what is the narrative here or the story or the macro trend, okay? So um, we, we go to a Yahoo Finance, um, we go to, no, we go to Google for example. So Google, uh, you can see here, you can see here if you, you push the annual, every year it grows, right? But quarterly, you can see it's kind of stalling already. And obviously they are in the advertising market, there is, there's ups and downs. Um, but let, let, let's take, take a look at another, um, let's, let's take a look at NVIDIA. Okay, so NVIDIA, for example, that the AI boom happens, right? And so you, you can see it. this is the annual, so it, it sort of grows, yep. And on the quarter, for example, every single quarter is growing and it's growing very, very fast. It's growing, the clip is growing very, very fast. You can see the year on year change is almost 200% uh, revenue is growing. So when growth accelerates, okay, basically the, the, the point is you, you need to look for like uh, revenue, growth, uh, acceleration. Right, so in the past, you, you could grow at 15% year on year, right? But suddenly, in the past quarter, for example, it's growing at, at like 25, 30%, right? It's an acceleration in, in, in the revenue growth. Um, 
it just means that okay, that there's something happening. That's like a micro trend. There's a ton more customers coming in, and then you need to ask yourself: Is this is this growth like sustainable? Because we don't want one um, one quarter good results and stuff. We want a, a macro st- story of, for example, people are dumping money into buying AI chips, right? And then that will that will feed into the narrative, and that's when that's generally when you want to buy the stock because um, you're gonna see the revenue grow o- year over year, quarter over quarter, and basically the it'll grow into the market cap as well. So that that's really where the money is being made. Basically, it's when you can buy here and then buy here. Obviously, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's go back to the the notes. Uh, what is the narrative here? Okay. Um. Okay. We, we bring up bring up another example of Facebook. Um. So Facebook is a. Facebook is an interesting narrative because uh when they were reven- when they started. Um. Where are the financials? Yeah, so so th- there was one point in time where um, the revenue was slowing down, right? So you can see here, it's like, uh, yeah, for 2021, 2022, you can see uh, 85 billion and then 117. Okay, on, on this, it looks totally fine, but you can see like the, the profitability. It started decreasing. Earnings started decreasing. So there was like a investor panic. And um, the, the, the narrative about Facebook is basically it, is going from a growth company to a stable company, which means it's basically not spitting out as much cash as before, and it's not going to grow at the same clip, right? So if it's not going to grow at the same clip, it doesn't deserve that valuation because it's technically overpriced or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so what what you need to see in in that situation, okay, is that like um, let let's take a look at the stock price first. So Facebook at one point in time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, so you can see here. So in 2020, oops. Um, you can see here in in 2022 or whatever, it dipped, right? It dipped all the way down. It went from this. Okay, I can't. Yeah, you can see September here. It was almost at a high September 2022, and then in 2023, um, it dipped all the way to 100, 100. So it went from, it basically reduced. Uh, 300 percent. The stock basically plummeted 300 percent. Yeah, and at the bottom here is basically uh, when you have a company that okay, let me write this down so that I don't forget. Uh, when you have a company of like stable, like like generally if you're a growth company, and then you have stable revenue, and then uh, when the growth story the growth story right is gone or whatever it is, um, and people start selling the stock, so they start selling the stock, and then the the stock for example decreases maybe like thirty. Uh, to 60%, whatever, right? Then it goes from a, I don't know what the market cap is, but imagine it goes from $800 billion market cap all the way down to like a $200 billion. And then uh, the revenue, however, is still stable. It's like still stable at like maybe like uh, $80 billion uh, per year, something like that. This is basically the, like the prime opportunity to buy. Like this is, this is the best place to buy because the, the, the narrative, even though the narrative is that, oh, Facebook is slowing down, uh, the, the 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 growth is slowing down or whatever it is, but they still have stable revenue, which means that money is still coming in. Um, it's just that people are not so bullish about the company, whatever. And then if they somehow manage to turn it around, you basically bought it at a discount, right? It was it was going up here and it went down, right? And then at this point here, actually you should buy. Obviously, there, there's obviously risk to, to it, but generally when people when people have stable revenue and stuff, and it's a growth company, and if they can turn it around, and obviously if you believe in the you believe in a CEO and then the vision and the mission. Um, you shouldn't sell based on emotion. You should you should actually buy. Okay, so like, more of the story here is buy when it's low. Like every time, um, generally a, a stable company, right, or a, a good growth company, they suddenly plummet. There's the stock uh, definitely uh, suddenly plummets, right? Maybe like 30 percent or whatever it is, right? Some shock, usually call it a shock event or whatever it is. Okay, you want to take a look at, at the fundamentals. So you want to take a look at the financials. Right, is the business still sound? Is the business still sound? Uh, obviously, if the cash flow is still there, um, and has anything changed? Right, because generally, only, only the stock price decreases. It's not that the companies, uh, the employees working there are, are getting fired, or like, it's not that that there are still smart people at the company and they're still producing cash flow. So if they can turn it around, you can actually almost like maybe three x the investment. So this is what I I wanna remind myself that hey if, if you if you see this kind of things happen again for example don't don't forget to like take take a look at this opportunity 
because you always want to buy when it's low, right? You always want to buy when it's low. If it's high, right? Every time everybody everybody is 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 buying, uh, then you sell or don't touch. Okay, this was my mistake the first time around. Yeah, so sell sell when it's high or don't touch. Don't don't, don't even bother. Wait for it to to get low first. Because there's something called cost basis, right? Cost basis is basically, if I buy at uh, $20, I need to go to 40 to, to make money, right? But if I buy at 40, for example, I need to go 60. And if, if at $40 is already overstretched, then it's very, very difficult. Okay, how, how, how do I normally take a look at uh, the market cap most of the time? So how, how I see things is that, for example, Nvidia here, um, you can see on the right hand side, um, it's 1.63 trillion USD. So for me to 2x uh, my investment, basically, I needed to go to 3.2 or whatever it is. Okay. Um, I go to... Um, what is that company called? Okay, I can't think of any company now. <laughs> okay, basically, let me just go to a simple trade desk. So trade desk, for example, you can see here it's a market cap of uh, 34 billion. For for me to 2x my investment, I need it to go to 68 billion. And will it grow to 68 billion? Uh, you can see the quarterly is, is quite okay. The annual is growing. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, comparison between companies. Okay, comparison between companies basically means that um, if you want to kind of decide whether some stock is cheap versus its peers, whatever, you probably want to see the historical average of the stock. But you also can see a price to earnings and then price to share, uh, price, price to sales. So price to sales just means that they compare it against how much revenue, how much revenue or sales um, that you have. And then price to earnings is how much profit it, it spits out, basically. Yeah. So for example, uh, if Apple and Google, okay, they're, they're not similar companies, but imagine Facebook and Google, Right, both of them rely on on advertising heavily because they are technically competitors in a sense, right? And one trades at, um, one trades at like twenty five p, and then the other trades at thirty p. E. You would say you would say twenty five is cheap. If you are just comparing apples to apples, obviously it's not that straightforward, but it gives you a sense of how much more cheaper this this thing is versus this thing. Yep. So that's basically a comparison. Like you need to compare stuff in your industry. Um, for the companies to get a feel of like how cheap or how expensive is this thing. And obviously look look at the, the historical average, right? Historical average just means that, for example, in the past, um, Facebook is trading at a 30 PE and now it's at a 25 PE. So technically it's cheap. Technically it's cheap based on like time. Yep. So that's the other thing to look out for. Um, okay, rotation. Ro rotation is, is very, um, I won't say technical, but you, like I, I don't know how to spot rotation, like finance people in the chat. If you know how to spot rotation, please tell me because I actually don't know how to spot rotation. Um, it's like trends coming out. So, so rotation basically means that um, if the entire market is like, oh, there's a recession coming, for example, most of the time people rotate from like growth stocks, right? And then they go into the com commodities or they go into like the tissue paper <laughs> and then the, you know, all the like basic essentials. Oh, yeah, they call it essentials. Yeah. Um, and also this happens when, I guess, when interest rate increases, when the cost of credit uh, cost of borrowing increases as well. Um, and then when, when interest rate decreases, for example, then I think people are rotating the growth because they're like, okay, money is cheap, let's, let's, um, let's borrow a lot and then let's just invest into all of the like startups and all of the like innovative stuff, innovative companies. And generally when this happens as well, um, people are more forgiving. They, they actually like um, unprofitable, unprofitable companies actually get sky high valuations. So then they call it a, a bubble, right? That's normally when the bubble happens. Yeah, so basically when, when, when credit is cheap. When credit is cheap, this happens. Okay, this one, credit is expensive. So when, when credit is expensive, right? Um, then everybody looks at PE. They don't care about your your, your prices, sales. Because they, they, they want you to be profitable. So that, that's what I realized as well. In a, in a recessionary environment, basically this one right here, um, you need to be looking at PE because everybody will will focus on your 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 profitability. They don't want to buy unprofitable companies. When when credit is cheap once again, uh, which happened in twenty twenty one, for example, then you want to look for 
uh, the other the other stuff basically. You want to look for the unprofitable, the the very fast growing. They they grow at maybe you know hundred percent, two hundred percent a year. Uh, those type of companies, yeah, stuff like that. Okay, so um, how much growth are you looking for? Thirty, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of mentioned to what I uh, mentioned just now about the market cap. Um, it's really dependent on what you want. Are you looking for um, the twenty percent gains? So if your portfolio is for example, a million dollars. If it grows at twenty percent, it's like a two hundred k improvement, right? Uh, are you looking for a fifty percent gain? Are you trying to double? Are you looking for a hundred percent gain, right? Obviously, any anything above seven percent is actually considered decent already. So let's not be greedy about it. Let's take our profits when we can. Um, I'm just saying that if you like to be really really aggressive, for example, um, you obviously shouldn't be doing this uh, if you don't have a lot of money because you are basically gambling. Uh, but if if you wanted to, you could. Um, yeah, for example, uh, your $1 million investment becomes 2 mil, right? Something like this. Yeah. So you need to know how, how to look at it. It's like, hey, can the market cap go from 3 billion to 6 billion? If you think yes, then 100% gain is, is possible, basically. Yeah. Okay. And then investing style. Investing style, a lot of people say, oh, we need to long-term invest and stuff like that. Um, I've not been alive so long, so I, I can't really say anything. I've I have, no, I have no idea what's happening, right? <laughs> I'm not even in finance. That's the thing, right? How, how I see things is that if I invest in a company, like I'd like to see in like two to three years time, they, they should generally, um, they, they, they should grow more than S&P 500, right? So this should be more than what? 7% uh, Kager, right? That's right. So as long as it outperforms the S&P, um, I, think, I think you should be happy. I think that that's a measure of success because you're beating the market technically. But obviously, if it uh, does not outperform that, oh, does not outperform the S and P, then um, you kind of like you you are actually lagging behind. So let let's let's find S and P. Um, and then let's let's check. So for example, S and P in the past year is up twenty percent. Okay, so this is a phenomenal year. This is an amazing year, basically, right? It's up twenty percent. So. Um, yeah, so basically your, your entire portfolio should be performing th- th- for this year specifically only uh, more than 20%. If it didn't, right, then you're basically underperforming. Yeah. Yeah. So think about the, the time horizon, right? It's like, am I willing to wait one, two, three, five years to see your, your whatever your, your, your thesis play out? Yeah. And most of the time, because people get impatient or they keep checking their phone or whatever it is, but they, they invest in the company. They're not investing in like, uh, a gamble they invest in the company so they should wait for their revenue to grow right so you do, don't look at it like in between here for example if i invest in the company on day one right and then only at, at, at year three or whatever or if, if things change in the company then you you sell yeah so i won't say it's like super long-term focus but like um you need to know why you're investing in the company and why like, what is the growth story here like what why is this why would this thing have do this basically yeah if you can't write then just just put it in s b because um, as we've seen just now, it's a 20% gain. So it's actually really not bad. It's really not bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the last thing, as I mentioned, yeah, profitability, earnings beat. Oh, yeah. Um, so there's something called, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, finance guys. There's like, there's like earnings beat, right? Earnings beat. And then there's like guidance. So guidance is like, I think the company CEO and stuff, they'll say, oh, uh, we did this next quarter or what we expect. They always use this, but we expect that this will happen. For example, we expect to produce $100 billion in sales. So if they exceed the 100, 100 billion, if they actually produce 120, for example, then it's like amazing, right? Everybody wins, stock prices usually increase. It means that the company is like outperforming. Yeah. There's also like, I think like they call it soft guidance. Soft guidance or something, it just means that they... They don't expect the the revenue to grow very very fast. So generally, that that's where people sell the stock. However, they also do this sometimes it's because they lower the expectation. I think they lower the expectation, and then so that if if they really outperform the stock in the in the future, right? They actually um they actually um yeah like you you promise less and you deliver more something like that. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not wrong, a lot of the company that the CEOs right their their compensation plan is tied to the stock price. Yeah, so actually, if they are not dumb, uh, technically, they should have a long-term view of the business and, like, they are doing things such that it improves the revenue over time. Yep. 
So yeah, they do have incentive for for the for the price to increase, but that's why they also do buybacks sometimes. And then earnings beat is basically yeah whether they uh, whatever the, the, the guide the, the guidance is if, if they actually beat their on, on their earnings or what they promise that they'll do, uh then it's amazing. Then usually the stock price increases as well. Because it means that the company's performing well. Um yeah. Okay. Uh yeah, the last thing I'd like to touch about is that the the acceleration of revenue. So for example, let me write quarter one, quarter two. Uh, quarter three, quarter four. For example, this grows at seven percent. This grows at ten percent, um, and then it dips. Suddenly, it grows at two percent. Okay, so you can see here from a ten percent to two percent, it's it's very significant, right? It's like decreasing, decreasing growth. So decreasing growth normally means decreasing price as well, right? And it's like alert. Uh, it's basically this is an issue right here. Okay, so this is when, um, like what's happening with the company? Are we slowing down? Why are we slowing down? You know, all these questions will come up, stuff like that. But then suddenly in quarter four, they have an acceleration. They have a significant acceleration. For example, they grow from two to fourteen percent, and at fourteen percent, you can see it's, it's bigger than all of this stuff right here. Right. So it just means that there's something happening as a catalyst. There's a growth driver, whatever you want to call it. There's a growth driver, and you should probably take a look. Take a, take a look at why this is happening. Right. This is a long-term trend. Is it a short-term trend? Stuff like that, but you're, normally when when revenue acceleration happens, right, the stock can pop. The stock can pop like you know sixty percent. It can grow two x basically, and then all the people who are like fear of missing out who FOMO, they start coming into the stock. Okay, when that happens, right, you just you don't don't even do anything. Just sit tight or sell. Okay, sell. Don't like to me. I don't know. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't buy more, um, unless you're like super confident. But um, yeah, basically remember buy when it's low. Buy when it normally dips, like it drops off a curve or something, or and the fundamentals are still okay. Yeah, that's normally when you have the the most value, and then you can protect your cost basis as well. Cost basis is like super important. Yep. Okay, and okay, the last thing I think I've gone through all my notes so far, so hopefully this makes sense to you. Uh, look look for different industries, different companies and stuff. Look at the market cap. Uh, assess whether it's within your risk appetite or not. Usually the mag the mega cap. Uh, tech stocks can actually move very very hard and very fast because they rotate into the tech stocks very very fast uh, yeah they can pour in hundreds of billions of dollars per day so we've seen that with facebook yeah um yeah the last thing uh that i won't say i want to show you i, I mean I, I, li I like looking at google here i like seeing the historical so then i can gauge of like how strong or how weak this is because this looks fantastic right this looks like it's, it's literally just going like this. Um, but on a five-year trend, we're actually we're actually near the all-time high, right? So this this indicates to me that, okay, this is an index, but if this was an individual stock, right, then you should consider whether to sell a bit to take some profit and stuff like that. Yeah, because it's gonna go down again. Yeah, after an all-time high, um, you can't go high and higher forever, basically. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Let's go to Apple. So what I like to do is that I, I want to see like when I want to look into the business, I always look at their their net margin, basically. So you see here the revenue. Revenue for Apple quarterly, uh, switch it to yearly, is at 30, is at 300, right? You can see this number right here, 383 billion. So revenue has actually decreased 2%. So it's actually still so slowing down. And then operating expense, and then net income. So they they, they took home ninety seven billion basically. Um, the net profit margin twenty five percent. So twenty five percent net. Okay, the earnings per share normally all this stuff right. The effective tax rate. I don't even look at this stuff. I look at the net and then I look at the growth. So you can see like profits is decreasing two percent, but also revenue is decreasing two percent. So it's actually in line. Um, but it also tells me that uh, the margin on Apple is is very strong. Like twenty five percent for a hardware business is actually not bad. It's not bad at all, right? Um, versus something okay maybe we try to find a, a stock that is not um, uh, that's more physical product uh, okay LVMH is not a good example because it's too okay maybe you look at Tesla so t Tesla is a, is a physical products business technically they sell cars right they sell other things as well they sell software but majority is cars 
uh, you can see generally the there we go okay this is a perfect example so if I if I scrub back to here uh, 2022 they have a net margin of 15% right 15% 15 10 you can see 10 10 and then 7 so the, the net profit margin is decreasing generally this is not uncommon for physical product companies because there's cost of goods sold and then there's inflation there's commodity pricing and stuff like that so like the raw materials input is very very different for software and for 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 raw materials and generally uh for physical product companies the revenue can be very very high and you can see here like um they do like 80 billion right samsung samsung um volkswagen they do like what 300 billion 200 billion stuff like that so th there's revenue right um but then the net margin is maybe it could be a single digit it could be double digit but a low double digit it could be like a 11 to 20 percent basically right you 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 very rarely often see 30 to 40 percent uh net profit margins basically but it's it's not it's not good as well because of tax basically, but yeah, um, yeah. So this is generally how I assess. I think it's quite easy to see. Uh, the balance sheet I don't I don't really look at because uh, I don't really like reading the balance sheet. Um, cash flow is okay, but like I like reading the income statement. The income statement to me is the most interesting part of it because I, I I understand it. I can see where the costs are going. And then if you look into a financial statement, you can see the same thing. Where's the money going and how are they spending it? Stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, I think that's it for this video. Um, if you have any uh, thoughts, ideas, if you if you think like my, the way the framework is better on how to analyze better, please feel free to let me know. And I would like to learn from you as well. Yeah. So, thanks. Um, see you soon. Bye. See you.